Recording in progress. Everybody, we'll be, we'll get going in a few. We're right at the time. I'd, I'd like to go ahead and get started so I can do a, a short intro and we can use the, the hour that we have with Dr. Valle to their advantage. I know we have quite a few of our students and our, some of our faculty members on, as well as some friends from around the country that, that know Dr. Valle's work and wanted to, to, to sit in with us. It's always it's cool to have a Zoom that we can have guests from outside of the state. Uh, so again, welcome. My name is Enrique Aleman Jr. I am a faculty member here at Trinity University in the Department of Education. I'm the director of the Master's in Educational Leadership Program, as well as a co-director around with my partner, Dr. Alex Flores of the Center for Educational Leadership. Um, this is part of our 2021-2022 National Speaker Series. We're very fortunate uh, to have the ability to have some national speakers come in. So this is our third of the fall, third and final, third and final of 2021. So we're gonna end with a bang today. No no pressure to, to Dr. Valle. Uh, as, as many of you know, we've, we've been very fortunate to have these national speakers to come in and give us their take on educational leadership broadly, but also social justice, especially during the times in which we are living, uh, living through. Um, and uh, we thought as we were brainstorming a way to finish the, the, the calendar year. Uh, we thought we could bring Dr. Valle in. To, he, he's got extensive experience, not only as a school leader, uh, but as a higher educational leader, as a scholar, as somebody who's created partnerships, and as somebody who's mentored uh, not only doc students, but practitioners. And so he thought we thought it was a great great opportunity to, to end the fall uh, with, this, with such a person. Just, short, just a short bio uh, of him. Uh, Dr. Valle is currently the interim chair for the inaugural Department of Special Education at the College of Education at Texas Tech. He's currently a uh, professor uh, in the College of Education at Texas Tech and has been there for several years. He has also served uh, previously as the Educational Leadership Program Coordinator and the Federal and State Grant Director. He's uh, one of the wonders out there who's been able to really garner grants, uh, facilitate them, and, and continue to build on that work uh, for practice, for policy, and for leadership development. He got $12 million alone in the I-3 Innovation Grant. He's been extremely successful with the TEA's Principal Residency Grant, with again, with school districts from not only from the Lubbock area, from, but from across, across the state. As a scholar, he's a uh, former American Education Research Association Clark Scholar, which is extremely competitive in our field an American Association of Hispanics in Higher Ed graduate and a faculty fellow. So he got, he got both of them, once as a graduate student and one as, a, as an early career faculty uh, member. 
and he's also won awards at Texas Tech as a recipient of the President's Excellence in Teaching and the President's Excellence in Diversity and Equity Award. So he's gotten both of those awards at Texas Tech. Dr. Vaya's research focuses on leadership development through social justice, equity, and critical lenses uh, to prepare the next generation of executive, school, and community leaders. He's got publications in a, in number, in a number of venues, from journal articles to book chapters um, uh, and, and books. Uh, he's uh, had presentations on the development of educational leaders, the Latinx principal pipeline. He's done work on the, in the borderlands. He's done work internationally. I'm always, you know, before COVID, was always trying to follow him because he, he's, he's, he's consulted, he's presented, and he's worked with educational leaders from around the world, literally. Um, I know him personally. I've known him since, uh, since he was a grad student, became a, a tenure-track faculty member um, at Texas Tech. I know him to be somebody who's a mentor, not only to his own family as a, as a tío, as an uncle. To his, I know he's a proud tío of, of his nieces and nephews. But also has, uh, has seen him mentor early career scholars uh, on their scholarship and on navigating uh, the higher ed pipeline. So uh, he's got degrees from, I forgot to mention, degrees from the University of Texas San Antonio uh, in, uh, in bachelor's in science, as well as a master's in counseling and a master's in med leadership, both uh, from uh, UT RGV or UT Pan American, which is now UT Rio Grande Valley. And that's where he earned also his, his doctoral degree. As I mentioned, he's a, he's a former educator, counselor, administrator. Uh, so he knows K-12 very, very well and now has, has navigated very successfully the higher education, um, pipe, the higher education arena in, in numerous ways. So super excited to have him and uh, very interested to hear his topic tonight. Uh, Dr. Fernando Valle, thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you, Dr. Aleman. I uh, appreciate the invitation. Uh, muchas gracias for having me here today. Full disclosure, uh, I'm in El Paso, I'm in El Chuco right now. Uh, we are having a partnership work uh, tomorrow for the next two days with our US prep, with uh, Socorro ISD, meeting some uh, doctoral students, uh, amazing individuals from Isleta. And so we go where the work takes us. So I really appreciate um, Dr. Aleman inviting me to be able to um, engage with you in this space virtually and to talk about equity and leadership and instructional leadership. And more importantly, the impact that you all have now, you know, as, as faculty, as policymakers, as future administrators, current administrators, and um, aspiring leaders um, there at Trinity University. So again, thank you for, uh, in, uh, for the time to be engaged and in this space. Um, what I'd like to start off in sharing with you is a little bit of my lens and where, as Dr. Aleman shared, where my experiences come from. I mean, you see the map directly on the US-Mexico border, the Zapata, Star, Hidalgo, Cameron, and Willisee. They've always been known as the five poorest counties in, in the state of Texas. Well, Hidalgo is where I, uh, you know, where, where are and have always been my stomping grounds. My familia is still down there. So the border context is part of my, my heritage and identity, right? Uh, going to visit familia in Mexico, which is grandparents, aunts, and uncles. Um, you know, I've, I've worn a lot of hats and a lot of labels as a student, you know, I am first generation, you know, the, the Latinx monitor, uh, uh, mon you know, moniker as a faculty. Um, I'm also a migrant student and we are a migrant family. We uh, rode with, you know, host of families from Edinburgh Hidalgo all the way to the, the panhandle. Um, at one time I was identified GT and I think that one got lost in the mail somewhere, but I, uh, you know, eco disc and at risk. So, you know, when it comes to the state of Texas, I, I've worn a lot of those um, indicators. So they're not only part of my research and part of it in practice, but they become uh, um, you know, that personal factor of resilience. I grew up in a small town in San Juan, Texas, and that's what I learned, uh, strong work ethic, right? Everybody worked. Uh, we had a family business and uh, my dad was instrumental in leading and uh, growing us as individuals, right? Um, my K through 12 public schooling is in South Texas in Hidalgo County, which I shared. Um, and I started my career as a science teacher and then a, as a middle school counselor and then a high school counselor. And then, you know, turned over to the dark side, right? As I was told, like you're leaving us and you're becoming a school administrator. And, uh, and but that's where uh, I became a better administrator because I had been in the classroom and I had become um, and served in the lens of a counselor and an advocate. Um, I, I, I tag also there that um, it was in the, in, in the early 2000s where I was able to start my doctoral program 
um, when UT opened the doors with UT RGV now, Pan American, UT Pan American. Um, just so you'll know, south of San Antonio to Corpus Laredo, Laredo it was pretty dry. Um, there weren't any um, doctorates, EDDs, PhDs, or any MD programs south of that. So when I was mentored uh, by superintendents and, and um, leaders in the field, they reminded me that it was important that I take that opportunity and grow and, and pursue the doctorate because they couldn't leave South Texas to acquire um, that type of education. They had to uproot and move the families. There were no doctoral programs south of San Antonio and Austin. So that resonated with me as I continued and, and, and straddled both K-12 and higher ed. Um, I have been an assistant professor and associate and, a, and in the role of professor now and a department chair. And I say that in the cycles of equity and positionality because that's where I draw my research and my work from. So uh, again, I wanna, uh, when I say you, your staff and your team, I'm talking about you as a faculty, you as a director, you as someone who leads teams and staff is current in the classroom and you will be in current instructional leaders um, that the challenge for the folks that we work with is that, you know, that our children, when you look at equity centered leadership and you're really going to unpack that consciousness and do the work that we really have to aspire and see that all level, all of our children's, all of our children are capable of high levels of academic success. And that's easier said than done. Right. And, and we always talk in our teams and our work in our cohorts that all means all you know, that regardless of the child's race, gender, and social class, sexual orientation, learning difference, culture, language, religion, et cetera, um, these are the children that we serve. And if we're truly going to be servant leaders and we're truly going to be social justice advocates on a daily basis, we have to keep that in mind. We have to challenge status quo notions. We have to challenge that deficit mindset that turns into deficit practice, right, and guides everything we do in our schools. So, you know, we as adults, we are primarily responsible for student learning. And the easy way out of that is to blame community, to blame parents, to blame other spaces. So we really need to look at those traditional practices that, um, you know, are really good at, at, at placing blame on students, you know, and because a lot of our practices are not working for all of our students. They haven't been for the last decade. And then today we have a COVID impact on that, right? You know, all of our students have Chromebooks and different platforms. And, and they're learning in different ways, right? So we have to adjust and we have to continue to pivot so that we can continue to challenge achievement gaps and inequity gaps. You know, we have a quote here that a uh, quote that we use in our programs in our faculty teams that student outcomes will not change until adult behaviors change. And as, as future administrators and, and current administrators, that's our challenge to really bring aboard a team of educators that can, can continue to do that, to change our behaviors so that we can change student outcomes. So I leave you with some of those thoughts of equity consciousness for you and your staff and your team as stakeholders, as partners, as coalition builders. Uh, many of you in the, in the continuum of equity, you know, are about an eight, nine, and 10. Some of you are still rating yourselves of where you are in that continuum because we talk about it, we read it, but where in the space of your daily practice can you be that agent of change, right? When we lead through a social justice lens and equity-centered leadership. So what I wanted to share here with you is the work in higher ed has been continuous. Um, in the center, we center all of our doctoral programs and master's programs from, through problems of practice and inequities. Whether you are pursuing an educational leadership policy PhD, you're gonna be aligned with the Institute for Educational Leadership on a national level. And, and you know, to our advocates, our TTU policy fellows, you're gonna be looking at that policy and practice. If you're in our executive leadership and you're in an educational doctoral program, you're gonna be looking at current problems of practice and inequities. And you're going to challenge those and you're going to be a status quo disruptors. We center in our master's program, special populations, SPED 504, emerging bilinguals. And, you know, I did what everybody told me not to do. That's not the way to go. You can't do it. Um, yeah, it is the way to go. And it is what we're going to be known for. So when we create our programs and we revisit our curriculum as a higher institution, our team really goes, I mean, we like to say we throw down. We're going to look at curriculum. We're going to look at alignment and we're going to see what we're doing well and what we're not. And so the equity audits and social justice framing is our anchor for everything that we do when we're building leaders, whether you're at the master's or doctoral program. And, you know, I provide some equity anchors because looking at, you know, Muhammad Khalifa's work of culturally responsive school leadership, you know, um, but Richard Valencia's work on dismantling deficit thinking, you know, Tara Yoso's work on cultural community wealth, and then of course, equity audits. That's a lot of the anchor work that we've utilized as foundation, as scholarship, 
where we revisit now, what does that look like and sound like in 2021 when there's a lot of disruption, there's advocacy work seems to be more of a challenge, right? So when I talk about instructional leadership today, I want you to know that we've been doing this in higher ed and, and doing the work and re-envisioning and re-branding our programs because it, it is constant. Advocacy work, it is constant and it's something that you have to be mindful and center in your space. So we really want this to drive leadership influence and impact. What is gonna be your impact? What is your impact now in the classroom as a department in PLCs at a campus level, at a district level? And how are you transferring your expertise and the, and the expertise of your team instructionally into different spaces, right? And so everything that we do and like to do and, and really put our passion behind is competency-based. We want you to demonstrate that and, and transfer and demonstrate that expertise and that influence. So I wanted you to see a little bit of the framing of what our programs look like and sound like, um, because that is the work that we're involved in every day as advisors, as you know, field supervisors, as partners in school districts, a, you know, in our work in dissertation research, it's an important thread in everything that we do. So we can't just talk about it, we gotta walk the walk, right? So here's, um, and we, I, I am privileged to work with an amazing team of scholars that we all do this work to, together and we collaborate, right? Again, we do what higher ed told us not to do, collaborate, work in teams and form our own higher ed PLCs, right? A notion that disrupts a lot of status quo practices. So we've got a model and practice what we preach. So for those of you curriculum hounds out there, um, you know, I want you to turn um, onto the notion of, of becoming an equity broker through the curriculum that you lead, right? On one image, you see that information and data and understanding is where we always start and it's where we stay. You know, we have Siri and we have Alexa telling us, giving us information and news and data constantly, but where is our transfer of expertise? And where's your equity driven instructional leadership and how are you transferring that in the coalitions and the team building that you have? So looking at you know, the Center for Curriculum Redesign, we look at this nationally and we look at it at ourselves, at the courses we teach and the partnerships that we have. How are we transferring expertise? And we do it through a variety of ways. So I want you to really think about, if you start from the bottom up, you know, using equity data is our information and we have it, we are data rich. We have so much data and we talk about it all the time in our planning and we have equity plans and action plans in our schools and our classroom. Does that match your current mission and vision of your school? Does it match what you're really about? So if we really get to the understanding, yes, you're leading equity audits. Yes, you're implementing them, you know, across the community and district in your school. That's not a new, that's not a new phenomenon. That's, that's the practice uh, of best practice around equity driven instructional leadership. But if you're really going to get to the transfer, you have to apply equity driven instructional leadership through master schedules, through planning, through instruction, through your PLCs in all of the spaces. Because if you're gonna be an advocate in action, you have to do it across communities. It's hard just to isolate. And if the teacher and me throw in some DOKs in there. So I had to throw in the DOK and I'm like, all right, if we're gonna do conceptual reasoning and routine and DOK one and two, that's where you start. As an advocate and a social justice leader, that's where you start. You can't stay there. If you're gonna go into DOK three and four, you've got to extend your strategies and your application of your work and do that extended reasoning and thinking. And not just in meetings and talking about it, you gotta get in there and, and actually do the work. So I wanted to share with you a little of that curriculum context of how we approach our program and work and our partnerships and what we can do, each one of us here today, what we can do to really impact the equity-driven instructional leadership. And I leave you with that thought, where are you transferring your expertise to? And who are you transferring it with? Is it a classroom of students? Is it a school? Is it a district? Because that's our challenge. So on a, in a global front, I want to remind us that equity initiatives are not new and they are a global issue. You know, when you look at sustainable development goals and we look at the United Nations, this is why we gather as countries to help solve the world issues. And we have equity centers and we have equity projects in our country. This is a conversation that is ongoing and we have to find a way how we can do it, how we can make it work. And, and that's really important. So if you look at either and the work, you know, there, the hub there in San Antonio and across, there's always goals of ec educational equity that we can look at, that we can challenge our work with, our daily work, our semester planning, our quarterly planning, right? And what we're doing, are we doing this work? What does it look like and sound like for you? I can sit here and tell you what it sounds and looks like for me and my colleagues and our teams, but what does it look like for you? Because we all want accountability. 
But what does that look like on the daily when you plan and actually do the work? So as we revisit this as a national conversation, as a global conversation, of course, Texas, we're our own country, our own state and our own planet, right? We've got to bring this back to Texas. What does that mean for us, right? What is the ongoing advocacy and educational um, equity lens look for us? So we look at the statewide summary of TA's reporting, right, of 2021 star results. Yes, they were dismal. Yes, we were in COVID. Yes, some folks were online, some folks closed. And are they 100%, you know, what we're looking for? No. But this is a stark reminder that, you know, I purposely circled reading and math because reading and math are always up to bat first. They're the indicators of where we are if we want to compare ourselves to other states and other countries. 60% of our students are in do not meets or approaches when it comes to math. You think of your child not hitting meets or masters, the green or the blue, you know, part of the graphs there on that screen. 65% of our state right now is really working at the do not meets and approaches in math. Pretty much the same thing in reading. 57% of our students are in do not meets and approaches. There's plenty of work to do right now, tomorrow, this quarter, this semester, next semester, in the future, in the next five years. We know that this is our profession. So there's no better time to do it than now. What is your planning? What are your interventions? Are they, you know, in retrospect, are you being reactive or proactive, right? Because I'm talking to a lot of principals that are just, you know, buying more of everything and they're giving students the same. It's not working right now and you're going to shove it down their throats for another, you know, two or th another quarter, another six weeks. You got to really think about what we're doing to, and I know there's a lot of pressure you're saying, by, well, you're not, you're in higher ed, you're not in K through 12. We, I spend a good 60, 70% per, of my time in schools with school leaders in there because the fight is together. It's not me or you. We're not against each other. We got to figure out what we can do to make this work. So this is our challenge. It's in front of us. So we go back to what the state shares with us, right? Non-economically -econ disadvantaged students versus economically disadvantaged. This has been the literature forever. You look at ACT, GRE results. You look at any results nationally, eco dis versus non eco dis it's just gotten a little, a little bleaker, right? You look at this, this framing here, economically disadvantaged have a huge impact with meets and masters. They're gaining ground here and we're in the inverse, right? We're going in reverse. Our economically disadvantaged students in the state now have wider margins, right? They're dropping. And you know this is our reality, right? This is our reality of why the equity work and, and through the data and through your lens is powerful and why we can't accept status quo practices. This isn't going to get any better if we don't take care of it. So we, I mean, all of us together, right? Doing the work daily and, and pushing and moving. So I bring you back to the essence of our curriculum. The word essential was used in our country with employees when we went through COVID. And who, and who were the essential employees? A lot of my family were essential employees, right? And what does that look like? I bring you that full circle back to our teaks that our state board and our state, you know, when I remind uh, new teachers that this is the curriculum, you can't just buy it off teachers for teachers or Pinterest. You got to really understand this because it's essential. And you look at it, you want to look at it as a noun or as an adjective and everything that you do, it's absolutely necessary that we understand that essential knowledge and skills mean essential. This is the basics. This is where we start. This isn't where we stay. So if you're going to go back to do not meet and approaches, 60, 70% of our kids are not mastering the required curriculum. And mind you, every TA is going to bring educators, parents, business and industry representatives and employers to review, you know, whether it's a year, two years, all of these. So this is an expectation not only for our schools and universities, but for our business and industry partners that they're going to hire individuals that have these basic skills. And right now we have a lot of work to do, right? And so I bring you back to the concept of what essential knowledge and skills mean. If you're a principal supervisor or you are the principal or you're going to be a future school leader, right? How do we really impact the implementation of the required curriculum? I know it's not easy. I know it's work, but there are a lot of great schools that are doing it and doing it well, right? Because they're student-centered, not adult-centered. And that's another tough pill to swallow when we're talking about equity and advocacy. So I bring you to another state tool, right? To look at not only our essential knowledge and skills, but our effective schools framework that guides our work, right? As districts, as communities, as schools. We have our levers, right? Strong leadership, strategic staffing, the school culture, you know, high quality instructional materials. 
effective instruction, everything that school leaders need to be mindful of and skillful to lead. It's not multiple choice. You, we've got to lead all five. And you do this with practice and you do this with commitment, right? But I want you to think about the dispositions toward equity and mindset, right? What does that look like for you? Dispositions are powerful. Sometimes you can't change them. That's where you have to realize that sometimes we have to set some folks free. Sometimes maybe they don't belong in education. They're like, it's hard to say that. Do you realize we don't have teachers in schools right now? Yeah, I understand that. But we really have to think about how you teach and how you lead the effective schools framework. What mindset are you in? You know, are your folks ready to receive feedback? Are they ready to receive coaching from you? That's part of the equity leadership framework, right? The way you give feedback and receive it. And who are you collaborating with? Who are your stakeholders? Where are your parents in all of your conversations? Are they still the enemy that we look at? Or they're being brought into the fold to help us address issues and really understand what it is that we can do collaboratively, right? To really lead efforts. And so we think about our cultural competence and where we are on that, right? With the communities we serve, with the students we serve, and the parents that we partner with, and the coalition building and efforts that we take. That's part of our professional communication you know, strategies, right? We're instructional leaders. We're leaders all the way around. What we say matters and what, it's, what we say and what we do counts. So I leave you with some thoughts on, on equity challenge as policy leaders, as instructional leaders and scholarship uh, leaders in actions. Think about as instructional leaders, as leaders period. We're responsible, you know, we, we don't do anything. We don't partner, we, it doesn't matter who we're partnering, what we're doing. If we're doing on a class, we're gonna do an equity audit. We're gonna look at the, your school and your district through that lens because we're gonna address the inequities. And we're, we, if we're gonna address them objectively through a data portrait, we need to start with that data. So it doesn't become my chip on my shoulder or an emotional stance. It becomes one of truth and fact, right? However you wanna look at that, but it's always a starting point. It's not the end, it's a starting point. But I challenge you to think about the action plans that you're creating. Are they really addressing the, the neediest students, right? Are we using collected equity data to uncover and address inequities, you know, to support our most marginalized and minoritized populations? Who are you leading and managing and collaborating right now, right? Who are your multiple layers of stakeholders to create those action plans? Are they written by you? And then we want everybody to impact and implement them. We've, we can't do this alone anymore. We need to have a team of stakeholders um, to be able to help you move this, right? And so for future leaders and current leaders, you know, master schedules is something that I worked on a lot as a counselor and a principal. And, you know, it was the biggest source of stress because we want them adult centered and not student centered. Elementaries are fantastic at doing this. Middle schools and high schools, sometimes not so much. But for those of you who are rocking it out, kudos to you for doing it. Because I've been in middle schools and high schools that are building and reconstructing their master schedules around the student centered. When all the policy came out in 4040 and, and we had all of the, the instruction that needed to be added, there was two camps that I had to work with. Those that didn't have a clue that was coming and were stressed because they had to change their master schedules because they weren't student-centered. And those that already had those spaces and built into their schedules and didn't skip a beat in doing it. I know it's a lot of pressure and work, but it starts there. So if you think about equity-driven instructional leadership, right? Be skilled at modeling instruction. Make sure your teachers know that you know how to teach because they weren't with you when you were a teacher. They're with you now as a school leader and a principal. Make sure that you can model, not just talk and deliver. Model those best practices in PLCs. Get up and have a teaching moment because you got to bring people along. You can't just sit there in the front of the classroom and, and, you know, and preach. Get up there and teach. So if you're leading te teams and PLCs, make sure that you're doing it to develop your human capital, our greatest asset, just the way we're looking at students. Teachers need that growth as well. So don't discount. Don't have a closed mindset with teachers that are struggling. Bring them in. Grow them just the way we do with our most at-risk students. They're our biggest asset right now as we look at development of human capital. And I leave you with this thought because I want to be mindful of my time here. Um, Equity-driven instructional leaders, right? That's you. Move your teams away from deficit practices. Move your teams away from basic data sharing as the only thing we can do for minoritized students. Be an equity broker, step up, right? Build the coalition of stakeholders expertise, use it, frame instruction through that base, right? I have this image here um, that I'm collaborating with different partners. If you're in a school, regardless of what space it is, make sure you have different partners in there. We shouldn't have to do this alone. And that's one of the things that we're proudest with that 
when we have partnerships with school districts, you're not getting rid of us. We're going to be around for a while, right? We want to, not only this year and next year, we want to support you as we move forward. And, and think about at your nonprofits and industry as a partner in what you're doing, because this is, we're all in this together. It's a very difficult time and we need to build up coalitions to be able to frame instruction and student support through these lenses. So um, that was a quick brief uh, commentary and, and just a, a quick overview, you know, um, on some of the equity driven leadership in the different spaces where I'm privileged to work and collaborate. So, you know, I leave you with that, like, you know, join us in becoming a status quo disruptor, right? Become that equity broker that, that our students need, that our communities and that our schools need. So thank you, Dr. Aleman, for the opportunity to present with you today. Excellent, thanks so much, Dr. Valle. And as I put in the, in the chat, I encourage any, any uh, questions uh, from folks. Uh, I, I'm gonna lead off, because I have a couple that I'm gonna take the, the gavel as the chair here to, to go ahead and ask my first one. But um, I wanted to hear more about status quo disruption, like status quo disruptor, like, that this is probably one of the biggest questions we get. I feel good that, that we, that our program, uh, I was looking at your anchor work. I feel good that we've introduced a lot of that anchor work early on and we have an accelerated program. So we, yep. we have them for 14 months. And I know you've, you've run programs in different formats and you know the, the challenges of getting all this content, all the internship stuff we have to do in a year. So you, you know the challenges of that. But the anchor work, I feel good that we're, we're, we've introduced it the question's always like, so how do you do it? How do you, what, is it what does it look like? What, what does it look like to be a disruptor of the status quo? Uh, so I was kind of just wanted to start there. Like if you had, and you, you provided already a couple of examples, but as you're, talk, as you're thinking of a lot of our master's students, they're, they're into it, but the question becomes is how do you do it? Can you provide some examples of that or one example? Sure, absolutely. And thank you for the question. Uh, one of the things that we broker, and I'm going to use that word because I'm, I'm leveraging it here in the space, just like cultural broker, is a long-term impact. You know, I know what internships are about, and I know that we're in the classroom and we're trying to do, you know, use your own students. And if you're really going to make an impact, it has to be long-term. You know, if you're going to make an impact and you're going to show student growth, it's got to be over the entire school year. This isn't about an assignment and a semester project. So if you're going to start really dis disrupting the status quo, and I meant it when I said it, we, we center everything around special ed and, and emerging bilinguals, because that's where everybody has the toughest and school leaders. When they take on a school, that's gonna be the first challenge. So if, you, if you're gonna work, you're gonna take on those students and find the most highly at risk student that you can. Somebody who's never passed, somebody who's they've been given up on. And you work with that student, whether you're in the classroom or you're already an administrator for the entire year, that's a different kind of challenge that I'm gonna do this for an assignment, check off the box and upload it. No, 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 no. This is a real child in real time. So that's one of the ways that we start, right? There's many, but that's one example that's near and dear to a lot of folks that like you, Dr. Alman, that we are serving in our programs with because they're in your classrooms right now, right? And if you're the teacher and you're teaching all of them in middle school and high school or elementary, you know where you can make an impact, right? And that's one where you can model because you've done it and then you can coach and grow. And as you take on a school, you take it with you to the next level. Nice. Got a couple of questions here, one by Robin. Uh, as an instructional leader across many grade levels, do you feel HB 4545 is positive, positively impacting small group instruction, support and closing gaps? What are your thoughts in terms of equity? Uh, Robin, thank you for your question. And I'm gonna go straight to the folks that I'm working with. So um, there are many principals and school districts that are hiring tutors, you know, retired administrators, I mean, retired teachers, they're hard to find right now, right? The first thing I'm asking the school leaders and that leadership team, whether you're department chair, teachers, everybody who's in there, are you training those individuals? Don't just hire them and bring them on your campus and say, here, we need this X minutes. Here, we need to do this X minute. If you are going to positively impact small groups, you need to take a command of that small group and their needs. Small group is for individualized instruction, not for an, uh, a tutor to go in there and babysit. And I, I don't mean to sound rude and disrespectful, but I've already seen that in that panic of the first six weeks where they're pulling out kids out in the hallway and they're doing great work. And at the same time, I've been in buildings sitting with, with our students where I literally have somebody out in a small room just kind of reading the kids. And it's kind of like, what is really happening here in this instructional time? So yes, I know it can be a support with that individualized instruction, but there's different strategies for that and there's different planning. If you're 
taking your kids out from instruction and putting them with somebody and you haven't really planned for it, you're missing out. So what I leave you with is the pre-planning and the planning for that instructional space. When it's done well, it's successful. And if there's no pre-planning and planning, you've wasted the kids and the tutor's time because now it's just, you know, you're just kind of hit, it's a hit and miss. And what strategy are you targeting? And what teak are you strat- uh, targeting? And is it, your, is, it, is it a readiness standard? All of those things that you're an expert in, you really have to make explicit to really address the needs, right? And it, it can be a show and a checkoff box for a lot of schools. And unfortunately it's happening right now. So thank you for your question. Yeah. Miguel is asking, um, what do you do with those that are higher up in the administration who are set in their ways? How do you work with them? And where do you start? So again, a lot of our students, Miguel's yeah. an instructional leader, a coach already, uh, but we have full-time teachers. We have you know, folks that are trying to figure out what the next move is as far as career-wise, once they get the master's degree done. But it's like there are, there are, there are long-standing you know, administrators who are set in their ways. What are some strategies that you could give them? Absolutely, and thank you, Dr. Man, uh, Dr. Aleman. Miguel, that is like the most powerful question, right? Um, I was told early on in my career, Miguel, that one day day you will be at this level. One day you might be at central office. One day, and the realization was everybody around me had planned out my life. I had to stand in the loyalty line, Miguel, and wait for the higher-ups to do what they're going to do so that, like, you know, and so you have to really think about, and everything around you is a model, Miguel. Are you looking at practices that are student-centered and that you want to emulate? Or are you looking at practices, and, and I get it, the higher ups, right? Are, are you looking at practices that you would never do and you would never treat your teachers that way and you would never treat that students that way because they're adult-centered and not student-centered? You have to really look at the team that you're joining. And I know this sounds very facetious, like when I was a new administrator, I was just happy I got hired, but you're gonna be in a position with what team are you joining and why? If you're gonna leave the position you have now and you're gonna go be a school leader, is it in a space in a school where you can make an impact? Or are you going to be branded to do the same thing that everything else, everyone else is doing? So if you think about that and they're set in their ways and you join a team, how can you model and disrupt that by the successes and the way you think differently? Because one thing is just talking about it in the team. Another thing is bringing back three weeks, six weeks, nine week results because we implemented the strategy that Miguel was thinking about in the PLC in fifth grade, in third grade. So now you're, de- you're demonstrating results. That's more powerful the data, right? We always go back to the data because it's not my opinion. It's not what Vaya thinks. It's now I have data to show you that this work is getting results, right? With our students, with our teachers. So there are, it's not about you against them. It's what you're bringing to the team that you join. I would be rather known for the work that I'm doing than, you know, the team. And sometimes you have to be out there on their own and it's lonely. But you know what? If you're doing it for the kids, you're out there on your own for the right reason. So thank you for your question. Nice. The, I mean, the follow-up for me is, and it's related, you're, you're starting to answer this already, but um, put yourself back in, in, the, in your master's program and yeah. understanding this context right now. What kinds of advice could you give our students about next steps for them? Obviously, do well on the master's program, yeah. Yeah, you know, exactly. and, you know, the, the pale and the pastel, that's part of what we're thinking about right now, obviously. But what are some other things that they can start thinking in terms of, Next steps for them. You, I mean, we have people who want they want to be principals. Yeah. Others who are like thinking in terms of you know what are what are next next moves for them or what are next things they can do to position themselves as they develop their career. That's a, that's a great question. And to all of your students, Dr. Lemon, my favorite my favorite conversation to have is someone who didn't get into our principal fellows and is fighting two or three times to get in. Right. And so, what are you doing between then and now? So, if you're in the classroom. You know, you, we have a task list that we need to do for internship, especially if you're in a 15 month program, no one is going to give you the opportunity and say, Hey, you know what? You should sit in here. You have to figure out where you can take on leadership opportunities. If there's an opportunity to lead instruction wise, you better take it. And I'm not saying you have to be at school till 10 o'clock at night. I'm taking during the school day right now, make your own list. What is it that you're leading right now? Besides in your classroom, are you leading uh, through technology? Are you leading you know, through parent initiatives, what is it that you've taken the opportunity to grow? And don't wait. You asked to be, you asked to serve, you asked to join in there. 
because that's going to make the difference between you interviewing and telling the, the committee, well, this is what I would think I would do. This is what I hope to do instead of, let me tell you what I've done growing students. Let me share with you the instructional opportunities that I, that I went and fetched for myself, that I you know elbowed my way in there, pulled up a chair to the table because you're not always going to get invited, right? And sometimes it's after school. Sometimes it's during lunch. Sometimes it's, it's, it's in spaces. But you've got to figure out during your workday when you can accumulate those instructional leadership experiences that you can talk about. You're never going to get them all sitting behind the desk in the class. If you're in this program here at Trinity and you have the opportunity and the mentors to do it, you now have an opportunity to write an email to your, to your department chair, to your assistant principal, to your district leaders, to your principal. I'm a learner. I'm an adult learner. I'm a future aspiring school leader. I would like the opportunity to, and then fill in the blank. You're going to get a response from me if I get an email like that from you, right? That somebody's trying to do, you know what? We got a meeting coming up. Why don't you come in and help us plan and lead instead of, well, let me wait till the end of the semester and you, you sign off on whatever I'm doing. I didn't even know you were, you were hustling for a school leadership program. You've got to be your own advocate. And as my colleagues say, you've got to use your own voice. You've got a powerful one. And, and you can share with Dr. Aleman and, and, and all of your people in the program and your colleagues what you want to do. That's fantastic. Who else knows that besides your people at home? Who else in the district knows that you're ready to lead and you want to move up? Who else have you shared that? Not in a space of arrogance, in a space of confidence and wanting to grow and step up. Believe me, not everybody wants to be a school leader. You're already there and you're already leading half the charge and half the battle. So give yourself that opportunity. Be bold in the sense of, I want to grow. I want to learn. Nine times out of 10, you're not going to get turned down for being that person who wants to grow and has to learn. I get a lot of emails a day, and so does Dr. Aleman. Very few of them are in that space of wanting to grow and expand. Most, it's like, hey, I have a problem. Can you help me fix it? Mm -hmm. Hey, I got a problem, but I also have a solution, right? Hey, let's go. Let's get after it. That's a great question, uh, Dr. Aleman, especially when you're in the classroom and you feel that you're constrained. Yeah. You already have a lot of expertise. That's why you're in this program. That's why you're fighting for your master's degree and all the certifications that come with it. Where from here, to April and May, can you acquire those opportunities? All of you are going to lead PD when you come back in January. Have you volunteered to be part of that? And if you haven't, why haven't you? Well, I'm not qualified or I don't know. When are you going to be qualified? When you graduate? When are you going to get, get rid of the nervousness? And well, I don't, you're always in front of your teams and your colleagues. Step it up. Let's go. You know how many times I had people ask me, can I help you lead PD? Absolutely. Right. You take this part. I'm going to take this part. It's called teaming and we're going to do it. So think about how you're going to finish the year and think about how you're going to start the year. What are you going to change? Because Dr. Aleman and the team can't do it for you, you know, but you can. You can step it up and say, hey, I want to be part of the planning. Use your, still, your skills and your strategies and your strength to jump in and be part of that, right? And that visibility is huge, right? And even if it's working behind the scenes, you're the one who's gonna benefit from it. And so are your students. That's good, that's good. Another question that I had that I've always wanted to ask you, I don't, I don't think I've ever asked you this one, but talk a little bit about your international work. I just wanted to hear a little bit. I mean, you've traveled, you know, a lot of different places. What's different about what others, or what sticks out in your mind from some of the work that you've seen around the world internationally? and that we could be doing better? Or what, what are some similarities? I just kind of wanted to just to share a little bit about some of the travel you've done, some of the learning you've done, and how, you know, as a migrant kid from South Texas, right, who's, you were traveling since you were little anyway. I mean, you just took it, you just took it international, you know, so I just kind of wanted to hear a little bit about that. Thank you for that question. And it is a humbling experience to be able to partner and work with um, educators and educational leaders in different companies uh, countries. Number one is the humility and to think that we have all the answers. Um, looking at curriculum in different countries, they embed a lot of the things that we talk about and think we're doing. It's already in their curriculum, right? Um, when it comes to literacy and mathematics, especially, small countries don't have the extensive resources that we have. So their students are coming out, you know, some of, in some countries fully bilingual because they know that uh, English is a, a language of commerce and partnership and an opportunity. So when you go into a country um, and that we think is a third world, um, I walked into a, a school and they're like, oh, why don't you come and see what we're doing with robotics? And they're partnering with John Hopkins University, right? 
And so here we think in the US, we're the only ones that have global partnerships, that we're the only ones that, that are doing the work in this country. And so that though that onion layer becomes to, you know, peel back that the world is, we're connected. Everybody, everybody's got a phone, everybody's got internet, everybody has access to, we have access. It's the fact of how we do it. One, you can't replace the care of an educator, right? Whether, you know, everybody's sitting outside under a tree or you have a lavish building, right? And the ethics of care is one of the things that I'm first introduced to and looked at different languages and culture, but it comes across from the school leaders. The second thing I always look at is the way different countries and communities enlist their parents as partners and brokers instead of the enemy. And we have a bad habit, especially in secondary schools, looking as parents as a problem and something that we have to really think about how we're gonna address instead of building in into the world of education, right? From K to 12. And that's always another lens that I'm very impressed with that um, it's, it's just normal, right? To be part of your community and your school. Little things from hosting a lunch to, you know, hosting meetings to where parents come in and out, right? Like as they're part of the school not visitors that are, you know, held outside at the door where everybody igno is ignored, right? So those are spaces that I, I talk about, that I'm sharing with you about, you know, the culture that hits me. And then with research and practice, right? Pedagogical practice where there's always refinement in the lesson, right? And, and people are talking about it, different ways that we do it, but always refinement of pedagogy and practice. Is it different than, than ours? Yeah, because it's a different culture and a different background and a different language. But school leaders in many countries um, are the entrepreneur, are the business partner, are raising funds, are you know evaluating teachers. They wear multiple hats that in many of our districts we have the resources for and have four or five levels um, where a school leader means many different things in many different countries um, where they're articulating um, all of those different levels of work to sustain their building and their facilities. We have the luxury of coming in and out. Our students are the ones that move. In many schools, the students don't go anywhere. It's the teacher who comes in because if I don't have a room in a building, that's why a lot of our countries go to school half a day because there is nowhere to fit room and we don't have the money for three buildings. So the kids come in at 7.30 and leave at two, you know, or at 1.30, but they've done more instruction than we've done all day, right? And then the next room comes in at 2.30, 3 o'clock till five or six. And the students don't go anywhere. The teachers are the ones that are facilitating the learning and, and moving in and out of the building. So those are just some of the on boots on the ground um, differences that I've been part of and experience. And, and they always want the same thing. You know, they ask us like, okay, you represent all of America being here in this country. Why do you all do this? Why do you all do that? So I have to be very um, cordial and, and politically correct. And when they, you know, when they're burning us for like, well, if you're so great, why do you all do this? And why do you all do that? And how come you all have this? And so those are the questions that um, teachers and principals like to ask. And I know I'm going to get it. Um, but the most, the, the thing I enjoy is the smile on kids' faces that's universal learning and the light bulb moment when they get it, regardless of what language it is, you can't fake that. And that's truly universal. Um, and it's a blessing to be able to bring that back and infuse that into the way we look at um, the construction of our instruction in our curriculum. That's great. That's great. Dr. Vanji Aguilera is asking an SEL question. What are you seeing within SEL and the impact it has had on the core curriculum? Thank you, uh, Dr. Aguilera, for your question. Um, and thank you for being here, I really appreciate it. Um, SEL has always been um, an issue in our schools and now it's been highlighted because um, TikTok and social media uh, raised our kids for the last two years. Um, you know, and I'm like, why are we not using it in school if that's what the kids are doing? They can spend hours, they don't wanna do homework, but they can spend hours getting it right because it's being uploaded to the world on TikTok, right? And why aren't we using that for PE and yoga and wellness, right? where sometimes the adults were in our own way, right? So I say that because that's where social emotional learning disconnect is, that we wanna force things that are good for adults into the space of a child. And we forget that their social emotional learning space is, is that core of their home life, of their school life, and how we can intertwine that. Um, many of the educators that I work with in not only Texas, in different states, really opened up about, wow, online learning allowed me to see my kids home where they lived and what they have and they don't have. I said, so that veil coming off 
is part of that veil of adults to really understand that social emotional learning is the most important thing that we can do to receive how we receive students, whether it's virtually or, you know, standing in the classroom. You don't know how many times teachers fought me on, why do I have to stand by the door? And why do I have to stand the store? We shouldn't have to make you receive children into your classroom. You're already sending a message with a negative face and a negative disposition. Like, why are you here in my class? Well, if that's the way the kids is gonna be received, no wonder they skip your class, right? And that's not a new conversation. That's an old conversation. And it still happens now as the adults, how do we receive the students? And I'm not saying we have to fix every issue that the community and our school has, but just from that disposition of how we receive students into our classroom really dictate, dictates the social emotional learning. There's a lot of great educators that did amazing things with YouTube during, you know, they had children pick their songs and their colors. And from kinder, I saw it in kinder and third grade, and they did a, a, a TikTok version, you know, and to the classroom with grandma and grandpa, right? And they got them involved in, and they did incredible things, right? Because they allowed themselves to really take the learning of the student and center it in the curriculum, instead of saying, you're over there and I'm over here, and there's no way we can meet in the middle. So the social learning, uh, the social emotional learning is huge in our core curriculum, right? How are we making connections to students? I had a conversation in a training with Mario Brancamontas who was at our university. And he said, do you know why the, all the, there's a lot of stories with pets in, in our STAR exam? Have you looked at it? No, why is there a lot of stories with pets in STAR exam? Because that's one thing that brings social emotion and learning to a lot of our kids. Not every fo fortunate to have one, right? But there's a lot of spaces that we overlook because it's not kosher to the adult, right? And we think the kids should get over it. We have to remember that children need to be children, right? We have to allow them in that space. Um, and when it comes to the core curriculum, there's a lot of things we can do to connect. There's a lot of things that we can connect our culture and, and different language. It doesn't always have to be about the food. It can be validating the children's space and bring that asset-based that asset -based, um, learning into the classroom to augment the core curriculum. Sometimes the thing is that we just get lazy and it's on, you know, OneDrive and I'm going to download it because that's what the district gave me and that's what I'm going to give the kids without any creativity or connection to SEL. So it's within our reach and within our, our, our power to be able to do that. One other question from Daniil, who's uh, one, of our, one of our students. She's, she's asking, you talked about equity in the context of master scheduling. Can you say more about what we should consider as we are learning about creating master schedules? How do we ensure that it is student-centered and equitable? That's a great, great question. I'm gonna start with my elementary school folks because they do it best, right? There's schools that get away with not doing any science, right? Because they have a double block of math and a double block of reading, right? Because our kids are behind. Um, why can't you teach math and science, math, you know, uh, science and social studies an expository text through language arts? Why does it always have to be discarded, right? In the periphery, those are the places where the students are the most interested when you bring social studies and science curriculum. Do your figure 19 and do all of your English language arts through those environments, through that framework, because we are so driven as adults of how we see the curriculum instead of how the children see the curriculum and how they best embrace it, right? So if you look at those spaces and how you're championing those spaces, um, you really have to um, really frame that Okay, time out, Dr. Um, Aleman. I reread the, the chat and I lost my train of thought. Focus me on the question again. I'm reading all the chat. I shouldn't have done that. It's like squirrel. I turned that way. What was the focus of the question? The master schedule. Oh, you talked okay. about the master schedule. So how do you ensure that it's student-centered? Yes, and that's where I was going and I lost train of thought. The elementary uh, principals that I work with really create a curriculum pattern where the students have opportunity to get the most out of their schedule because the principal and the teachers create that in the elementary world, right? So when you see a well-distributed and a well-articulated schedule where they're getting a lot of repetition, but it's not just math all day or reading all day, that's a well-rounded curriculum. When you get to middle school and high school, it's a little different because we have computer programs that are gonna spit out 95, 97% accuracy for us. And we can utilize that, but you're the one who's running that school. You know where the students need to be and you can move students around. Right. Sometimes all the students our most neediest students are in a certain area or a certain um, um, framing with teachers. You're the one who has to unpack that. Right. Where are my most neediest students during the day? Pull out those schedules and follow them. Do they have the strongest teachers in your school 
Or are they with your teacher who just walked in the building again, right? Because we love to do that. In high school, you know how many times I got reported by, you know, to administration central office because I asked our best English and math teachers to help. Hey, take a senior section and can you take a freshman section? You're the strongest teacher that we have in the school. We need your help to align. That resulted in a political call to central office, right? How dare you demote me from the senior English teacher and the senior economics teacher? You're the best teacher we have. You're going to get these teacher, these kids again your senior year. Let's start out with them with a strong foundation. So those are the conversations that you're going to have on the master schedule. The ABCs of Texas are still athletics band and cheerleading. Guess what? When you go to a when you go to middle school and high school, you start creating your master schedule. The first person knocking on your your your, your door is going to be the the athletic director, right? Where are all my athletes? Where are all the girls? Where are all the boys? And are, is it a zero period, first period? You can't have all the students in band and try to have an AP English section in the morning and a calculus section because they're all going to be in band. There's going to be nobody in calculus and in, in, in AP English. So you really have to look at your master schedule and how it's designed and, and not just the AP kids, but all of your students. So when I say about student-centered, there's a lot of practices that we leave to chance and we let the computer program figure it out because we're 97% accurate and we don't want to touch it. Let the computer program do it. Where is Where are your students in that conversation? And where are the teachers? Because we all want eighth period off. I don't want to be here till 10. I want first period off. You know how many times I got that request? You know, because that's what I mean by adult center. Hey, and sometimes we break and move things around. But keep your students in mind. Follow your English learners. Where are they? Follow your special ed students. Follow the, the 10, 15% of students that are struggling. Look at them in the master schedule. Where are they? What teachers do they have before you release that? And I know that's hard to do because we're always behind and we're always pumping out schedules a week before students come in. Master schedules shouldn't be done then. They should have been done in May and June. You already know what kids are coming back. That way you have all summer to look at it. So thank you for that question. That's great. The ABCs of Texas. It's still the thing, man. It's still the thing. But it's, that's what I was told. By it. It's not the yeah. kids we have to worry about. It's the adults. I'm like, what? Yeah. Okay, I, right. I get it. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question and I'm going to go ahead and ask it and it's really I wanted to take you back in time again like I'll, and I probably should have started with this question is talk a little bit about why you even do what you do like what inspired you to go into education educational leadership and what are the things that still inspire you today like there's so many challenges that our school leaders are facing, students and families, they're all facing it right now. I mean, we're living through, probably in our lifetimes, uh, some of the most difficult challenges related to the racial reckoning, to obviously COVID, to now like social emotional, what, what people are facing within our schools, within our communities. Obviously we lived through a very divisive uh, election last year, but that's that really hasn't dissipated that much. Um, so the question is, like, think back to when you got into this business and what inspired you to go that route? Like, what are, what are the things that shaped you as a leader early on? Maybe you hadn't thought of it, but that's really what took you in that direction. And are those some of the things that continue to inspire you to get out of bed and to get and to do the work that you do and to and to keep you moving forward, given all the challenges that we're facing? Great question, um, and, and thank you for asking that, because it does go back. First grade, a uh, teacher gave me a blue ribbon, and she had me stand and read the book that I wrote, right? She, and she told me, you're a good writer. And so that stayed with me all through. And in fourth grade, I was put back into a class uh, where nobody could read because I was a migrant student. And the, the teacher would tell me, like, you're a smart kid. And I remember being in there and looking around and nobody could read because I was now in a class with migrant students, right? So now I was in the at-risk class, right? And that evolved. So teachers always had a really big impact and, and she pulled me out of there. And in seventh grade, I was in a math class, nobody could add, you know? And then I got pu pulled out of there and put into a regular quote unquote seventh grade math class, right? Um, because I had labels and, you know, if it wasn't for my family and teachers saying like, what are you doing here? Like, you know, you can actually read and add, you know, kind of thing. And they pulled me out, you know, and, and moved me and my senior, you know, I had great teachers in high school, some that were very inspirational. So I always had them forward. And I also felt I had the best of both worlds. I had a, a, a father who was a leader, 
um, who did construction, had a roofing company. So I got to be a student and I got to be a construction worker. And I learned how to lead with being the youngest of, of a group of people right out in the field. So leadership is, I was always pushed right to do more. So when I became a teacher, I got to see my students not only in class, but at HEB and they would stare at me and one little girl, like she just froze, right? Like you have legs. Yes, it's Sunday. I'm in chanclas and shorts and a school shirt and don't look in my basket, right? Cause the whole family is just staring at me like, and that's when I realized that you choose education and you didn't choose to become a role model, right? I'm gonna see you at church. I'm gonna see you here. And, and I would always tell my students and it, and it became even more um, impactful, right? When I saw them out in sports and, and doing, excelling and doing, and they revered the space that you gave them and that the parents, and all of a sudden you become this role model that you weren't thinking as a teacher you were going to become. And, and, and that space always stayed with me, you know, and, and when I became a counselor and, and, and into school leadership, you know, one layer um, pushed into the other, you know, and I always had uh, amazing role models, right, that pushed me and that said, you need to do this. You need to go back and get a master's, right? That was my middle school principal. The high school principal said, I know you're supposed to go to the, the middle school, but you need to apply for this job. And people were always pushing me. So I was very fortunate to have all those role models, but I also had to make sure I got the work done, right? Because it's not just about having the job. So I stayed in education because I learned that I was making an impact for students, you know, um, when they graduated and they want to come back and tell me that they graduated, right? When they got a job. And in high school, I was fortunate to work with the valedictorian and salutatorian and then do home visits for the kids who had dropped out and weren't coming back and, and going into the colonias, you know, and, and all of those spaces shaped who I was and into the leader and to the advocacy because we do it every day when you're in public school. Nobody just calls you out on it, right? When you do those home visits, when you talk to parents, that's social justice and advocacy work and that's what it looks like every day. We just don't call it that in public school. Right, because that's what you do to make an impact in students. So when I had the opportunity to continue, my mentors were the ones that reminded me, we couldn't get a doctorate. We couldn't leave South Texas. We couldn't move to Austin and San Antonio to become the leaders that we know we could. You need to do it for all of those who couldn't. So yeah, I felt that pressure of all the old guard and the old dog saying, you need, it finally came into our backyard. If you don't do this, you're gonna regret it. Did I know what I was getting into? No, I had no clue. I burned hard the first semester with the research course and everything because I was still running a high school for 60, 70 hours a week. And I thought I could drive to Pan Am 15 minutes before class and read a doctoral textbook and go into class. I didn't give it respect because I didn't know what I was in for, right? And I had to, you know, get down on, you know, I had to get folded and, and be humble again to respect the space of being an adult learner, not just a leader. And in that space, I learned what it meant to be a different kinds of leader and that I did have some of the background for it and the backbone, right? And I was always told, you have a backbone by my father for two reasons, to bend and twist and adjust, but to stand straight up, you know? So I take that to heart. He said it in many different ways, right? But I take it to heart to this day because it is our backbone and it is who we are and it is my comunidades and it's, I always tell my people, these are my kids, these are our kids, these are our students, never those students, never these students, never, that's that's where the deficit mindset starts. So I've always taken it very personal and coming to higher ed was the biggest risk I think I could take because I didn't think I was enough. I didn't think that I had enough to be what I envisioned, you know, professor should be. And for a minute, you know, I was reminded every day of what I didn't have in higher ed, right? So I went back to what I knew build teams, build coalitions, partner with school districts, mean it and, and bring it back. And so that's why I've sustained in the leadership position. So now I feel privileged and blessed to be able to do it across the state, across you know, state lines and work with phenomenal scholars, uh, you know, phenomenal uh, a team that I get to, I'm privileged to work with every day, right? That we go out and do this work. So now it's a different platform, but to still impact students in the classroom and teachers and principals, right? And we do it through this venue. So uh, thanks for the question. I really appreciate it. No, oh, thank you, man. Thank you for thank you for taking the time to to share your knowledge with us and um, and to inspire us with your words. I, I always I always love talking to you because because you you really do get to the cut to the chase on the the issues that are important. Uh, well, of course, you bring in the literature too. I, I I love the way that you're able to do that, and uh, I know our our students will appreciate. The, the words of wisdom and we're going to keep talking about it this week they're headed off to class right now yep. this is your point. 
But uh, I'd like to thank everybody again for attending. This is our last uh, speaker for the year, for the academic, for the calendar year. We have three more speakers coming up in the spring that we're, we'll be announcing uh, and, and advertising. So we hope that you can be part of that. But until now, uh, thanks again, Dr. Valle. Really appreciate it. Everybody have a good evening. And uh, thanks for attending. Thank you. Appreciate it.